presidential inaugurations. Ahead here on C-SPAN 2. Atlanta, a debate in the... Georgia Secretary of State Max Cleland, Vietnam veteran who is the head of... His Republican opponent is businessman Guy Milner, who in 1994 was the Republican nominee. Jack Cashin is the Libertarian candidate. This debate was recorded in the studios of WSB-TV in Atlanta on Sunday, and it's moderated by Atlanta journalist John Pruitt. This is a special edition of the U.S. Senate debate of WSB-TV in Atlanta. Pruitt. Good afternoon. Georgia is on the verge of historic change. For years, Sam Nunn has represented the state in the U.S. Senate, often facing little to no opposition for re-election. Will all that change when Senator Nunn announced last October that he is stepping current term ends? With us, it's on the ballot to succeed. These three will be Georgia's next U.S. And Democrat to you. Joining me of journalist Jay Bookman from the Atlanta Director of AM750 WSB Radio to political reporter Bill Knight order of the candidates and the order of questioning has been determined by drawing. The first question goes to and Mr. Cleland will also have a chance to respond to the question. Mr. Milner, the first question to you. Uh, we're increasing the global economy where our young people are going to have to be educated to meet the standards of that economy. In many cases, we're going to be competing as a nation with nations that have stronger edu uh, educational standards than does this country with better results. Many people feel that national goals and priorities are necessary in order for this country to meet those standards. You reject Global 2000, which set national goals and standards. You call for the abolition of the U.S. Department of Education. My question is, how can we compete with other nations of the world if we don't have a national plan of goals and standards and some sort of national apparatus to help local systems implement them? Thank you, John, and let me thank Channel 2 for offering this debate, and let me thank our viewers for tuning in on a, in a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Number one, education is very, very important to me. Uh, I've worked closely with our school systems since the mid-80s, and I believe sincerely that the bureaucracy in Washington is not what advances education in Georgia. In Japan, you have one administrator to one teacher. In America, you have two administrators or bureaucrats to one teacher. I want to get the cost of education out of Washington. I want to get all of the bureaucracy, the rules and regulations that really hold back our teachers from being able to do the job. Our teachers are great. We ought to pay them more, and we ought to get more money to the classroom. Should we have goals and standards set as a nation that local systems should try to meet? You know, I found in my business that when I allow my branches to set their own targets and their own goals, they always set a higher target than a headquarters might say. Uh, I've got a lot of confidence in Cedar Grove High School, where I've been working since 1986. And the SATs in that high school have gone up 80 points in the last nine years, and the SATs in this country since 1965 have gone down 80 points. Federal laws and, re and, and regulations and rules, John didn't do one thing to help with that education. All right, let's move to Jack Cashin, the libertarian candidate. How do you feel about the federal role in education? What is the proper role? <clears throat> well, I can use a good example. I live in Cherokee County. My taxes went up from 8,000 to 20 three years ago. 78% of those taxes went to the school board. My daughter, who lives on the farm with us, has seven, five children. And seven years ago, she decided that she didn't like the educational system that we have. And she decided to homeschool. My 13-year-old granddaughter, who just was tested this summer, she qualified three quarters of the test that she took at the 12th grade level. I think we should privatize as much as possible I, schools. I think we should get away from the high government uh, intrusion in our lives. The, the government can't dictate 
what we do with ourselves, our own personal responsibilities. Like my daughter, I felt that I had the responsibility of raising my own six children, and I didn't want the government to tell me what to do or how to do it. So I think we should privatize as quickly as possible. Let's move to Democratic candidate Max Cleland, and you have views which sharply differ from your opponents. Mr. Cleland, could you explain? Absolutely. I support Goals 2000. I support national goals to raise the standards of excellence for our teachers and our students. I'm a graduate of public education here in Georgia from Othonia High School in 1960. I know that if we don't improve our public schools, we're going to be in trouble in terms of our economic competition. I don't support vouchers that take taxpayers and, and, and the, the money that is supposed to go to public schools and send it to private schools. I especially want to open the doors of access to higher education through student loans, through a tuition tax deduction. And I especially want to see our businesses get a tax break so that they can train and retrain our workforce. That's the one thing that's going to be able to give us a higher standard of living and compete successfully uh, in this international economy we're going to face in the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Cleland. Next question from Jay Bookman of the Atlanta His question for Mr. Cashin. Uh, Mr. Cashin, your two opponents uh, differ on assault weapons. Uh, Mr. Cleland takes the position that uh, there is no legitimate need for those weapons. The right to bear arms is protected by the Second Amendment. Uh, given the government regulation, it's to your position on that issue. I think it's every citizen's right to own a, own a uh, gun if they wish. I think assault weapons are a pretty stupid way to kill a deer, a uh, pheasant, or something like that. I don't, I don't think if I were a crook, I would not have to go to the process or go through the process of, of signing my name and giving a five-day check. Because if I were a criminal and wanted to use a gun, I'd get it. It doesn't make any difference. So this government-mandated rules and regulations that we have, again, are, are anathema to me and my fellow libertarians because it doesn't work. Government can't dictate what we're going to do. And uh, as I said before, crooks are going to get it whether it's legal or illegal. It doesn't make any difference. As far as assault weapons are concerned, I fail to see their value as a, as a, uh, in the hands of a, of a person who's hunting, if, for example. Response to that yes. question. I support the, the, the federal ban on assault weapons. We don't need assault weapons back in our communities to kill our kids and our law enforcement people. I carried an assault weapon in Vietnam, an M16. I know what one is designed actually to do. It is designed and manufactured for the mass eradication. We don't need those weapons on our streets, and I strongly support the federal ban on putting assault weapons back in our communities. Mr. Milner. You know, the, the law is misstated uh, because assault weapons are already banned. The young lady came up to me in Richmond County. She said, I was threatened by my husband. I went the next day and I bought a handgun so that I could protect myself. Uh, my opponent, Mr. Cleland, would like to make her wait seven days because of the fact that the criminals are going to go ahead and get the weapons anyway. Let the criminal get that weapon on one hour's notice. Now, I believe that the Second Amendment to the Constitution is very important. We know for a fact when a concealed weapons law was passed in Florida, the right of a Floridian to carry a concealed weapon in 1987, violent murders are right is down in that state by 38 percent. We warn you where the Brady Bill, which my opponent supports, extended to 15 days, is 50 percent higher than the national average. So you tell me the right of that young lady to be able to protect herself is the wrong decision. I want to, I want to let her have that right. But, but you would vote to overturn the ban on assault weapons if that vote came to the floor of the Senate? It's mistitled. The assault weapon is already banned. It. It's a semi-automatic weapon. Legislation, it's no different than that. Lead to. John, I'm concerned about that constitutional right, the Second Amendment. Bandit, which is a weapon that you see on 
40 people, you know, are, are killed or something like that. That is banned today. To overturn that ban. That's not the vote that is before Congress. If it did come before you, would you vote to overturn Opposed to the average person. Automatic weapon would be outside of the current legislation that we already have in place. And they yes, mentioned here. Let me just make my position clear. This is a clear difference. Uh, I support the federal ban on assault weapons. We don't need those in our communities. I would not vote to overturn the existing ban. Brief rebuttal, Mr. Milner. Well, my opponent doesn't understand. The assault weapon is already required today. You must have licensing. You must have identification. You cannot own that weapon unless you can show, show a true reason to own it. The ones on the street today <coughs> are illegal. The semi-automatic weapon is really what that assault weapon legislation is all about. It really is mistitled. Let's move on uh, to Condis Presley of WSB Radio. Condis, your question for Max Cleland. Mr. Cleland, good afternoon. good afternoon. As Secretary of State, you were responsible for the supervision of an investigative arm of the office, the Securities Division. Now, through some of the reporting of my radio station, we were able to uncover the sex a sexual harassment claim that had gone uninvestigated until we exposed it, and then that department had left your office, but through the involuntary separation clause of the state, left the office with a very large pension. We also questioned the hiring of an investigator in your office by your de a new department head, who, when we questioned that, because there were questions about the qualifications of the investigator who was hired, the head of the department resigned. My question for you this afternoon is, how can the voters of this state trust you to manage our interests in Washington when you've had a number of problems managing your own people in your office as Secretary of State? Well, I feel very good about my record as Secretary of State over the 12 years I was there. But let me just say, in, uh, specifically in response to that, when the charge of sexual harassment came to me, uh, I put together uh, an investigation that looked into the matter. Uh, when the second charge of, of, of sexual harassment came to me, uh, I relieved that individual of their responsibilities. The pension matter was up to the merit system, and I had no responsibility in that regard. Mr. Muller, this question does address the system to Cleveland, but I'm sure you probably have a rebuttal on this. You know, I really appreciate the question because you have two cases here. One case of a lady who was fired, who had been given a perfect two months prior to being fired, 13 years, no pension, no, no, no careful handling by uh, Mr. Cleveland. You have a person who was investigated and found that they were involved with sexual uh, harassment activities by your station. That, that was a male, by the way. That was a white male. He was given a $58,000 pension. I can say that he didn't have any responsibility for that just like he can say that he didn't have any responsibility for letting Ronald Kingsman, the, the convicted killer, out of prison. But I'm sorry, the record states it very clearly. He could have gone on record as opposing that if he had so chosen, but our research shows that he did, gave no opposition to that pension request. Well, just a second here. To bring up the Kingsman matter again, I've said repeatedly I had nothing to do with getting someone out of jail. The Secretary of State has no responsibility in that regard. Uh, I might say that in terms of the sexual harassment case, uh, when it came to my attention that this was a pattern involved, I relieved the individual. The individual had been a long-term state employee and qualified for the pension uh, under the merit system. I had nothing to do with that. On the other case, uh, that was an individual that I relieved based on the, the, my understanding of uh, the best for the office and the attorney general settled the case. I have a good record as secretary of state and I feel good about uh, the progress we were able to make. Mr. Cash, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, the comment I have is I wish these fellows would stop shooting at each other and tell us what they do positively. That's why you're in the middle. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> it's I'm kind in of the a middle. buffer here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's move on to Bill Nygut, WSB TV political reporter. Bill, your question for Guy Miller. Well, Mr. Miller, let me pick up on something that Mr. Cashin just said. The last time that we met in this studio was during the Republican primary debate, and the discussion of negative advertising came up. And I asked you to run negative ads if you were the nominee for the Republican Party. You are. I don't think many Georgians have not seen your ads in which you've uh, talked about Max Cleland and the, and the parole letter, talked about the uh, uh, problems that you perceived were in his office. Now, 
you have called those issue-oriented because you say they're about him, but, but the tone of the commercials, the grainy black and white photographs, he's doing this to you too. It's become part of this year's political process, making him look as, as mean as he can, as awful as he can. Are these not negative ads? And perhaps more important, the Pearl Letter was written 13 years ago. It's become the cornerstone of your campaign. Is the single most important thing that voters should know about Max Cleland? And why didn't you stay positive in this race? Bill, thank you for the question. Let me just say that we've been offered, this debate is one of three that my opponent and I have had a chance to have a joint appearance. We've been offered 44 around the state. He's turned down 41. As recently as uh, uh, three weeks ago, the Georgia Farm Bureau, which we, we, in other words, when you don't have an opponent who will engage you in the public and share their positions on the issues, it makes the case that you have to run truthful, factual ads. And I've tried to be well documented. Uh, I believe your station has been given all the documentation. Frankly, I think a letter to the Pardon Parole Board, I think that's an important issue. I think Georgia voters need to know that. And I wish that we had an investigative reporter uh, like WSB Radio here to look into that. We didn't have that. We didn't have the public discussion. In this general election, I believe the public, frankly, lost out because my opponent was not willing to share that joint appearance. My question, sir, though, is you, you, you have made that really this, the cornerstone of your campaign. That, that has run as a commercial more than almost anything else you've done. Why should voters think of that one issue, which Mr. Cleland weeks ago said he made a mistake in doing? Why is that such an important issue with everything else that needs to be addressed in this race? Well, we tried, Bill, to make uh, other issues. We tried to focus, for example, on the firing of Mabel Harris, a very long-term 13-year employee. What I have is I have a career politician. Max is a nice person. He's a nice person. Uh, he's a career politician. He's been running for the U.S. Senate for 25 years. The Brunswick News reported him as saying that he knew that his letter would have some influence. Uh, I believe it characterizes a person. Either one or two things are happening, Bill, in that letter. Either it's the good old boy network being looked out for, he's helping a buddy and a friend, or he doesn't believe a person who gives two life sentences should be released. I think the public needs to know that information, and I think they get real upset about it. The statement of the Brunswick News is an error. And let me just say that CNN, when it looked around the country uh, uh, to find an example of dirty and negative campaigning, actually cited the Milner campaign against Johnny Isaacson back in the primary to which you refer. And of course, that kind of character assassination has continued in this campaign uh, in regard to me. I might say that what we have here is a tremendous need for campaign finance reform. The current system, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of, cam of financing campaigns for the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress <coughs> is a macro in the moonlight. It both shines and stinks. We've got to change it. I have called upon President Clinton and Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, to call a special session of the United States Congress after this election to get to the bottom of changing this system. We need it changed. We need tight limits on money in politics Mr. and on special interests in politics and open the doors for public participation. Mr. Cooley, That's the kind of reform I support. If I could follow up since it was Please. my question that started it. Uh, uh, Mr. Milner is certainly correct that for at least a while, we're delighted you're here, obviously, but, but he's right that for a while you did seem to pursue a strategy in which you prefer not to debate. Now, whether that has anything to do with whether he should be running negative ads is another matter, of course, but... Now, isn't the real issue, Bill? Uh, what happens in these debates? What happens in these, in these debates is... Uh, we end up in, in uh, this tit for tat here. What is that the voters don't really get the real issues discussed. I mean, let's talk about improving public education. Let's talk about what it takes uh, to put together an economy that competes successfully in the global marketplace. Let's talk about uh, how we take care of our elderly and our seniors, and let's talk about something genuine like campaign finance reform. Those are issues that have been obscured in the campaign by all this other stuff. Let's get Jack Cash in view on this. To Let, that? In just a moment, let's get Mr. Cash, and he's been sitting patiently. We, we as libertarians, and me personally, have gone around the state 
talking about the issues, trying to get them to ex be exposed and talk about the ob objective of simplifying, economizing, and dignifying government. And we will continue to do that, and we have done that. And again, I lament the fact that, that both my opponents have been a feel necessary to deal in negative activity. Very briefly, Mr. I'll be I'll be very brief. Max talks about after this election, he's going to call on some sort of campaign finance reform. He called on open debates the day I won the runoff. He said, let's debate all across the state. And he's turned down 41 opportunities. The first opportunity we had to have a joint appearance and to discuss the issues that he says are so important to discuss, the first time that he would engage me was October 19th. Brief rebuttal from Max Gordon yes. before we move on. At the outset of this general election campaign, I called upon Mr. Milner to voluntarily limit money, big bucks, in this general election. He declined, because he's got the big bucks. That's the problem. We've got to tighten up on big bucks in politics, the influence of individual and special interests, and we've got to open the door to public participation. That's the kind of reform we really need. Thank but you very to much. Open, Mr. Pruitt, to open the door, don't you have joint, doesn't joint appearances open the door? Don't forums with the Georgia Farm Bureau and the Middle Georgia Board of Realtors and the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce and, the, and, and, and Savannah and Augusta, those people deserve to know where we stand on the issues. Why can't we open the door without paying for ads? Mr. Cashman, very briefly. If, a guy, had, if guy had invited me to these other forums, I'd have been there. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank let's move on. Let's, let's move on. Since we do have all of the parties involved here, let's move on to other issues. And my question now for Libertarian candidate Jack Cashin. Mr. Cashin, the, the Libertarian Party proposes legalizing drugs in this country. My question to you is, since I would venture a guess that most Georgians would not agree with that policy, do you support that party, the policy of the Libertarian Party? How would it be accomplished? What do you think the effect would be? In 1919, we passed prohibition. In 1933, we repealed it. In that 14-year span, we spawned the greatest crime wave that the country has ever known, personified in the Al Capones of the world. In the early part of 1970, we embarked on a drug war, so to speak. Since that time, we are spending billions and billions and billions of dollars. We haven't won the war. We're putting people in jail, in prison for victimless crimes. And I think that what we have to do is examine all of the alternatives as to this unwinnable un un war that we are not winning. And uh, legalization of drugs is one alternative that should be considered. There are a lot of other things that should be on the table that we should discuss before we put this to bed, but it has to stop. Do you support the idea and concept of legalizing drugs in this country? If it's the best alternative, yes. All right, let's move to Max Cleland for his views on this, which I think I can probably guess, but also the national war on drugs. How would you fight it as yes. a U.S. Senator? Yes. <clears throat> this is very relevant uh, to our state. I oppose the legalization of currently illegal drugs. Matter of fact, as a former military man, I'd like to support my fellow Vietnam veteran, General Barry McCaffrey, in stepping up the war on drugs. I'd like to use the military to intercept and interdict illegal drugs before they ever get to this country. Because our law enforcement personnel and our communities out there are in this war. I know a war when I see one, and we've got a war going on. The real question is, are we going to fight it and win it, or just turn it over to somebody else? Mr. Milner. Uh, I oppose the legalization of drugs. I believe that drug and alcohol abuse is one of the worst problems that we have in this country today. And you know, the interesting irony is that in the White House, Mr. Cleland's president, Bill Clinton, calls in the, uh, for schools to be drug-free, calls for drug-free workplaces, yet doesn't call for a drug-free White House. All right. Uh, question now for the panel for Mr. Cleland from Jay Bookman of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, because air pollution in the Atlanta metro area has gotten so bad, and because the biggest cause of that air pollution is car exhaust, uh, the federal government will soon ban construction of new highway projects in Atlanta. Uh, that's a difficult situation. Scientists tell us that Atlanta's air pollution problem is causing an increase in asthma among our children and, and premature death among senior citizens. On the other hand, if we can't build additional roads, uh, traffic congestion will increase. Some local officials have already gone to Senator Coverdell asking him to weaken federal air pollution laws. 
How would you approach that problem as U.S. Senator? No, I, I think we need to strengthen our laws regarding uh, clean air, safe water, and clean soil. You know, I'm not one of those extremists who went to the Congress about a year and a half ago and wanted to gut the EPA and the regulations thereof and cut 30% uh, of their funding out from under them. No, we need to strengthen the EPA uh, nationally and locally here in Georgia uh, and work hard to clean up our air, our water, and our soil. No, I'm for strong environmental protection laws, and I've been endorsed by the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters. Mr. Milner, you next to respond. Uh, Thursday, I took my granddaughter, Julianne, to Chuck E. Cheese. She's two years old. Uh, that generation, uh, it's, in, it's, in, in, it's incumbent upon our watch to protect that generation as they go forth. I believe environmental laws, tough environmental laws, are very, very important. I think we've got to deal with clean water. I think we've got to deal with clean air. And I would never put out an effort to try to weaken our environmental regulations and the, the, the legislative climate. But let me say this. Um, we've got 19,000 employees of the EPA. 10,000 of them are in Washington, D.C. Now, I know Washington's a pretty dirty place, but I don't know if we need 10,000 EPA people in Washington, D.C. So I don't want to protect the bureaucracy of the EPA, but I want to protect our environmental... Uh, on the question, though, of, of whether you would support a ban on highway construction in Atlanta until that air pollution problem is resolved. Do you think that's a, a, an appropriate response to, to shut down construction of new highways, uh, even though, as we all know, uh, Georgia 400 is a, is a mess and, and traffic is a serious problem in the air? When I serve on the board of the Atlanta Chamber, the environmental issues, because Atlanta's got a good case going for really doing something about the environment in the year 2010. Uh, I applaud their efforts. There's a corporate volunteer effort underway here to reduce the use of automobiles in the metropolitan area. I'd like to see more volunteer work by, by corporate as opposed to less legislation coming out of Washington. Mr. Cash. I would like to see more public transportation, and I would like to uh, respond to the EPA. I'm a farmer, and I'm a member of the Georgia Farm Bureau. Uh, far, I, a fellow farmer in southwest Georgia was approached by the DOT and the EPA and they said we're going to take 40 of your acres which happened to be in more or less in the middle of his farm and he said no I don't want to sell and he said well yeah you, they've said yeah you got to sell so it turned out that the, both the DOT they, they had ruined some some wetlands and they had to mitigate they had to balance it off and so they had chosen his 40 acres as I understand it they were going to build a 50 foot wide road to get to it and he refused to do it and what happened ultimately was that the television and the radio and the newspapers got made a, such a hue and cry in that area they backed off but in the process of backing off they said we could do it anyway i think the epa is an intrusive organization that has exceeded its mandate and is far too too uh, coercive for its own good gentlemen thank you very much we're going to take a very brief break when we return, we will give the candidates an opportunity to ask each other questions. Welcome back to Channel 2's debate for Georgia's U.S. Senate seat. Republican Guy Milner, Libertarian Jack Cashin, Democrat Max Cleland are all with us today, and we've been questioning them for the past half hour. Now, we would like to give each candidate the chance to question the other candidates. Again, the order of questioning was determined by a drawing. We're going to begin with Jack Cashin, who will first question Max Cleland. Mr. Cashin, your question for Max Cleland. Max, <clears throat> my libertarian campaign has been focused on reducing the role of government in our personal and economic lives. In 92, you wrote a letter to Ted Kennedy that said America and the world need you. Yet Ted Kennedy is the personification of bigger government. What it is about Ted Kennedy's big government liberalism that you think the people of Georgia and the world need? Well, uh, let me just say that uh, I post Ted Kennedy at great length in 1980 when he ran against Jimmy Carter. And when I was head of the Veterans Administration in 1977 through 1981, I came across a lot of people in Washington 
uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle. Let me just say, uh, I think the government does not need to be bigger, but it does need to be better. When I was head of the Veterans Administration, uh, I tightened up my own office, put together an office of Inspector General, actually reduced uh, the expenditures in my own personal office. And I think there are areas in the federal government we can cut. I like to merge the Department of Education with the Department of Labor and strengthen our federal job training efforts. I'd like to invest more in education and grow our economy uh, so we can wipe out the deficit. So there are things we can do, I think, to move toward a balanced budget, which I uh, agree with, and keep our uh, federal government uh, intact. All right, the tables are turned, and Mr. Cleland, you have a chance to question Mr. Cash. Jack, it's nice to be with you. Thank you very much uh, for offering for public life. Let me just say, uh, I'd like to give you a chance to just <laughs> talk about the Libertarian Party and some of the things you stand for, and uh, just share, uh, share a little bit with us about your, your views. Which views do you want? <laughs> well, particularly, you know, you, you talked about the role of the federal government. Share us uh, your, your view. Well, I believe in less government is the best government. You know, we've used Thomas Jefferson to a fairly well, but Thomas, Thomas Jefferson said that government governs best that governs least. The Republicans and the Democrats have been lockstep for the past 60 years, piling government upon us to the point where it's a mountain of all kinds of bureaucracies and agencies, and uh, it's imposed its, itself on our private lives and our economic lives. And I would like to see government as a whole reduced. I would like to see these bureaucracies merged or eliminated if they are proven that they're not uh, valuable. I would give an incentive to the bureaucrats to economize. There is no incentive today. Let's say a bureaucrat had, had uh, seven million, uh, uh, $10 million program and he was able to save $3 million. Then give him 10% of whatever he saved. Let him take $150,000 and divide the rest of it with his, his uh, cohorts in that bureau. We'd have saved $2,700,000 of that $10 million. Give the bureaucrats an opportunity to economize the government. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Now, Mr. Milner, your question for Mr. Cashin. Uh, Mr. Cashin, let me also thank you for uh, being involved as a public, uh, seeking a public servant uh, role. Uh, we need to have more good people that uh, come from outside the political spectrum, very frankly, and haven't spent a career in politics uh, running for office. So I, I, I very much applaud your, your, uh, your efforts. Uh, you spoke about education reform. And how would you define the changes that you would like to see made in our uh, federal Department of Education? Or what role do you see the federal department playing at all? I think the Department of Education spends a lot of money, has a lot of people that are doing a lot of things, but not educating. I think this is a very good example of a government bureaucracy that has imposed itself self, and spent billions and billions of dollars but doesn't do the job. Over 50% of the money that is spent in education goes to the administrators. Doesn't go to the teachers. Doesn't go to the students. And that's one of the reasons why my daughter has chosen to homeschool, because the educational process is not a, a good process when it emanates from the top. It has to come from the gut. It has to come from us. We have to want to educate our children. We have to be teaching them self-reliance and self-responsibility. And you can't impose that sort of morality, if you will, on anybody from a, a distant bureaucratic government. Thank you. That's the first round of questioning. Now the second round of candidate questioning. We will start with uh, Jack Cashin, a question for Guy Milman. Guy, uh, in the presidential debate, the Democrats are calling for 8% growth in the budget and accusing the Republicans of cutting programs because they only want a 6% growth. Neither party is talking about cutting the government. What is the difference between the Democrats' big government and the Republicans' big government? Well, the Republicans don't want big government. And uh, I believe 1994 supported that. Uh, I go back to my granddaughter, uh, two years old. Her generation will pay almost $200,000 in interest on the federal debt in their lifetime. The Republican budget submitted to Congress would have uh, balanced the uh, budget. It would have lowered, uh, balanced the budget over seven years. It would have lowered the taxes for the average American family. It would re have returned the power to the states. It would have advanced initiatives to safeguard and protect for a long, long time the Medicare system. 
Uh, I believe that stepping back and looking at the federal government and seeing that we're spending $200 million every day more than we take in, I believe it calls for streamlining. I believe that it calls for, it, for reducing that focus in Washington. And frankly, I'm excited. Welfare has now come back to the states. That's a good move. That means that part of the program now is under local control. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see other parts of that federal bureaucracy reduced to the, uh, reduced to the states. Did you Can have I make a, a comment about that? Very briefly, please. Uh, yeah, the government, both the Republicans and the uh, Democrats seem to be fighting about decreasing the increase. They're not saying, stop, let's re-examine it and go back to where it's manageable and comprehensible. And uh, the contract with America fought with the Democrats to decrease the increase only slightly. There's very little difference, be in my opinion, between the Democratic and the uh, Republican government ideas. Let's well, move. Let me, if I could just quickly, very John, briefly. very quickly. Uh, I've called for the, uh, the abolishment of the Commerce Department. Uh, I've called for us to move the treaty stuff under Treasury. Uh, I believe that we need to uh, take, take the Energy Department, which was created in, in, in the mid-70s. Uh, it spends uh, $16 billion. Let's move many of those functions under defense. Okay. Uh, I believe that we need to make some structural changes in Washington, no doubt about it. Let's move to the next question from Max Cleland for Guy Milner. <clears throat> Mr. Miller, we've talked about the importance of campaign finance reform here today and of reducing the role of special interest in returning government to people. I have a question about the way you've uh, financed your campaign. You've made about $6 million in personal loans to your campaign. Specifically, please tell the people of Georgia whether you're going to forgive those debts or are you going to raise money from the special interest to pay yourself back for those six million dollars in loans? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Cleland, because it gives me an opportunity again to let voters know that you and I were invited to over 45 joint appearances, campaign debates, and forums across the state. Uh, you turned down all but three. Uh, I believe you did not serve the voters of this state very well. Uh, I have always invested in myself, but I'm running against a career politician who has spent the last 25 years of his life, as he was quoted in the Atlanta Constitution, running for the public office of U.S. Senate. Frankly, with that name recognition, serving 13 years as Secretary of State, having five opponents in a very, very expensive primary, what you have is it's very tough for someone outside the system to run for public office You've got to somehow create a level playing field. Mr. Milner, your question for Max Cleland. Mr. Cleland, uh, you were a high-ranking Democratic official, and you had a letter that you wrote to the State Pardon and Parole Board requesting that a murderer who was serving two life sentences be released. The murderer was released seven months later after they received your letter, and he went to kill again. Do you regret asking for the murderer's release from prison? And if so, have you ever apologized to the victim's family for any role you might have played in releasing the killer? I should have looked behind the facts of the matter uh, when I got this letter from a father in Columbus, Georgia, regarding his son uh, up for parole. I sent it to the appropriate agency, the Pardon and Parole Board. That's the only agency that can let anybody out of prison. The governor cannot. The secretary of state sure cannot. As a matter of fact, the man was not paroled. Later, the pardon and parole board, on its own action, took action with tragic consequences. I regret those tragic consequences, but they were not at my own hand. They were at the, at the decision of the pardon and parole board. My record on crime and fighting crime is very strong. I voted in 1973 when I was in the state senate for capital punishment. I still believe in it, especially for drug kingpins. And I, unlike Mr. Cashin here, would like to use the military in a greater way to fight crime and illegal drugs, especially using the military to interdict and intercept illegal drugs coming into this country. And I do support victims' rights. I believe victims ought to have a voice in every stage of the criminal justice process. Let's move to the, uh, this panelist for the next round. You really asked the question, and he did answer it, Mr. Miller. He didn't so. answer it. And my only point, sir, is that what you have is, I, I believe when you have played a role you ought to at least, I believe this family is watching today, this program. 
And I believe that you should look in the camera and say that if I played any role, any role at all, in Ronald Kingsman being released seven months after you received that letter, that you would at least say, I apologize and I'm sorry. Let's get Mr. Let Lewis me look at the camera here. I didn't play any role in that release, and he knows it. But he spent six million of his own dollars trying to trash me on this point. Now, I think we ought to move on to something more important, like college loans for students, uh, tuition tax breaks for, business, for, for students going to school, and how we're going to uh, improve the future of the state, rather than something like this. Let's go back to the panel now. The first question from Condis Presley of AM 750 WSB Radio. Your question directed to Mr. Milner. Mr. Milner, I wanted to uh, pick up on a point that you raised in the first half hour of the debate. You mentioned the situation involving Mabel Harris and the Secretary of State's office. And in fact, you are running a campaign uh, ad on primarily black radio stations with her endorsing your candidacy. You've also suggested that in certain campaign appearances, Mr. Cleland has taken the African-American vote perhaps for granted and that he was playing us for dumb by suggesting that he did not support the King holiday when in fact he did and other things. I'm wondering, are you not guilty of playing the African-American voter for dumb by thinking that by putting a certain type of ad on a certain type of radio station, you might generate more support. And as the question broadens out to all three of the candidates, why should African-American voters support your candidacy for the Senate? Thank you for your question, Condence. Let me just say that I, uh, I adopted at Cedar Grove High School and offered scholarships to over 400 African-American students. I don't take them for granted. Uh, I have been very involved with minority issues in this city. Uh, I believe that we have to do everything we can to create as level a playing field and get, ha have all ships rise with the tide. But then you also supported, though, you wanted to be a member of an exclusive, ex an exclusive club that did not allow African Americans or women to participate. I have uh, said over and over again that if my membership offended anyone, I apologize. I certainly don't support exclusionary policies. But let me speak about the ad that you speak about running. Number one, when I found that our people had not done the second level of research, I believe every ad that is run on television in a political campaign needs to be well documented. When I found that our ad had not, uh, we had not done the second level of research, I pulled that ad. That ad was pulled as soon as we learned that. And I made an appeal to my opponent, please document your facts or else please get your ads off the air. We have ads today during the football game because we have, we're appealing to, to, to people who are, who are interested in sports. We have ads for senior citizens on senior citizen program types. Uh, we probably are advertising in 15 different media trying to reach the folks that normally read or listen to that media. So I'm trying to reach out to the African-American vote and I hope that you would applaud me for doing that because I want the Republican Party to be a big umbrella and a big tent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cashin. When I was in the restaurant business, uh, I took great pride in, in hiring as many of the black community as I possibly could. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my proudest moments was when I was able to appoint a black lady who had done a superb job uh, to manager of our, of our uh, operations. Uh, a busboy by the name of Pearl came to me one day and said, Mr. Cashman, I want to be something more than I am now. Uh, can you help me? And I said, yes. If you'll go to the Atlanta Area Technical School and take any kind of program that you wish, uh, air conditioning, mechanics, uh, carpentry, whatever, and when you complete that, I'll pay for it, whatever it costs. And then when you complete that, I can guarantee you with all seven restaurants that I had, that I can bump you up from minimum wage to at least $15 an hour. And I was very pleased to be able to offer that to him. The, the black community is not an easy community to reach, and uh, I wish I had the money of the gentleman on either side of me, and I, I think I would have made, I have made an attempt, but I would have made a stronger attempt. Mr. Cleveland. Yes. The Miller campaign deliberately distorted my record, deliberately tried to trash me, with African Americans in this state, with whom I have a very fine record. Not only did I vote for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, when I was Secretary of State, I was the first chairman of the Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Commission. 
I, as Secretary of State, was honored to appoint the first African American as Assistant Secretary of State. I have a fine record with all the citizens of our state, and I didn't belong to a club for eight years while I was running for governor, like Mr. Miller, and running for the U.S. Senate, that wouldn't let African Americans, Jewish people, and women in the front door. That was Mr. Milner's lifestyle before he was embarrassed by the media on that point and embarrassed by the media and had to withdraw this uh, false ad on me. All right, uh, let's brief response, Mr. Milner. Sir. Please, Mr. Uh, Pruitt, let me, let me just say that one of the prices that you pay for running for public office is that you uh, oftentimes find yourself and your reputation being really taken down several, several notches. Uh, I don't believe there's anyone out there that would suggest that my life and any of my judgments that I've made would support any sort of discriminatory policy. And I appreciate you asking that question. But I do believe this. I believe that when you have fired a lady who you gave two months prior an outstanding performance record and she happened to be black, I don't know if it begs the question of discriminatory practices but it certainly does raise a very significant issue. I'm going to give Max Cleveland a very brief response, and then we'll move on. Do you have one? You know, I've, I've said my piece. It's quite obvious that the other campaign has spent millions trying to trash me with falsehoods uh, for many quarters. Now, let's get to the issues. Who's for student, who's for government-backed student loans? I am. Who wants to take vouchers and send taxpayers' money, uh, take it from public schools and send it to private schools? The other side does. Who wants to abolish the Department of Education? The other side does. I think there are critical issues in this campaign we ought to get to the bottom of. Thank you. Bill Nigat, your question for Jack Cashin. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the issues then. Um, Mr. Cashin, um, your less government is, is better government, you're the libertarians say. Let's talk about that in terms of uh, welfare reform now that it has arrived. Your opponents, I, I think it's safe to say, disagree on this issue. Um, President Clinton says that now that we have welfare reform, we need to put money into job training, more daycare, the kind of thing that can give especially women who want to give, are going to have to get out in the workforce some support so they can do that. Uh, I believe that Mr. Milner opposes more federal dollars, although I'll, he can speak to that. And I think Mr. Cleveland has said he would like some help out there. Where do you stand on this? Now that we have reform and we're going to kick people off of welfare, um, do we need some government aid to make sure they have the supports in place to do it right? Yes, we do. I think that you have to remember that the Democrats and the Republicans for the past 15 years, or 60 years, I beg your pardon, have institutionalized poverty, and it's in the form of welfare. What I would like to see, uh, first of all, I don't think a, uh, a state bureaucrat is any better than a federal bureaucrat. And just uh, throwing it back to the states is not necessarily the best way to do it. However, in a welfare program, let's say, for example, a person is on welfare and, and he or she, it's usually a she, is getting $100 a month. And I would say take a two-year span and say to that person, for each month we're going to reduce your, your uh, $100 by $4. January 97 would be $96 and February would be $92. But we're not going to take that money away from you. What we're going to do is leave that amount of money in as long as you take a training program so that uh, by the end of two years, you will have qualified to have whatever job you chose to train for so that there would be a program that wouldn't pull a rug out from under them, but give them an opportunity to learn and to train at the same time and not disrupt their, their uh, economic status. Mr. Cleveland. Yes. I'm very much for the welfare reform bill passed by the Congress, signed into law by the President. I'm for the time limits that it imposes. Uh, I'm also for the cushion underneath things like child care and job training that en enable an individual to move from dependency to independency. That is the whole purpose of the welfare reform effort anyway, is to train people and give them skills so that they can survive in the workplace. Now, Mr. Milner doesn't want any federal role in, in education whatsoever. I find that hard to believe. Yes, we definitely need, in the welfare reform package, strong job training efforts to enable people to be skilled and trained for that job in the workplace. Mr. Milner. Let me just say that uh, the day that Bill Clinton signed a Republican initiative and had Mr. Cleland been in the Senate and voted with Ted Kennedy, as Kennedy did, we would not have gotten wealthier here to the states. 
The very day that that was passed, and all the states had to pick up the responsibilities bill for welfare, we found that uh, D.C. was uh, conveniently wavered for 10 years. Uh, the Democrats said at their convention that they're going to bring it back to Washington if they can get Democratic co uh, control of Congress. I've, I've suggested that the private sector, the business sector, has to get involved with the welfare issue. I've met the welfare mothers. I've walked the welfare district. I've spoken and, see, and had a sense of their needs. I had a welfare mother tell me, I've got to find a way out. Take, give me some training. Give me some job exposures. Provide a way for child care for my family. I've been working actively here in Atlanta through United Way on a daycare center approach so that we can do something about it. We, we've got to find a way to have daycare for that young mother with two or three children. And she's trapped, John. She's trapped and she can't get out of the system. Mr. Miller, the Kansas City experiment where private uh, c companies were stepping in to try to hire uh, uh, welfare recipients has, has not succeeded by most accounts. They ju the, the ju people aren't prepared for the jobs. They're not ready to step in. Why do you think, that, what can you come up with that'll make that happen? I don't know who ran that experiment, Bill, but I'll tell, you this. Experiment. I'll tell you this. We're gonna fail and we're gonna have to stay working at it. And we're gonna fail again and we're gonna have to keep working at it. Because as Mr. Cashin says, this is generational. You can't say, well, it didn't work, and so let's, let's take something else. We're going to have to keep trying. Gentlemen, we're, we're about to the point where we begin closing statements. We do have time for one quick round of questioning. I'm going to ask you very briefly to answer the following question. Given the health dangers of smoking, the alarming rise in the number of young people smoking, do you favor tougher laws in the tobacco industry and fewer breaks for tobacco farmers? Max Cleveland, begin with you. Yes, I do. I do not smoke myself. I try to lead by example. Secondly, I think we ought to educate our young people about the hazards and dangers of smoking. And hopefully that will reduce the problem in the future. And finally, I would support the action of about 13 state attorneys general when they go after the tobacco companies to make them share uh, and live up to their responsibilities in terms of paying some of the cost of, tr of treating some of these uh, health care hazards. Thank you very much, Mr. Milner. Tougher laws for tobacco companies, fewer breaks for tobacco farmers? Uh, I believe that it's a, uh, I think we need to discourage smoking. Uh, I believe that uh, our young people should not smoke. I do think it's somewhat of a camouflage to get away from the fact that we failed on the drug issue. And I believe that, frankly, we've lost the war on drugs, and so we're trying to get sidetracked. Max Cleveland said that if anyone on Medicare had a smoking-related disease, he wanted to take them off Medicare. That was last week during our debate. Not true. Uh, that was the statement made during the debate. Right. You've got to stop you here because we're running out of time. Mr. Cash, your response. Government, 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 government. Every time you turn around, it has to be government. Why can't it be common sense and reason? We have a dichotomy here. We have a dichotomy where the tobacco farmers are subsidized by the government, and then we have another branch of the government down, down uh, trashing the uh, tobacco industry. On one hand, they say, hey, yeah, grow it and, and, and uh, put it up and, and put it in cigarettes or whatever. And the other hand, uh, it doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's a dichotomous, ridiculous situation where the government, again, is a good example of where it's out of hand. All right. We have to uh, finish our round of questioning now. It's time for closing statements. We'd like to thank each of you for being here. And we're going to begin the statements, which are limited to a minute and a half, with Max Cleveland. Thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just say I'm honored to have served the public in this great state and in this country for more than 30 years. Uh, since I went on active duty at Fort Gordon, October 18, 1965, as a young Army signal officer, I've been committed to public service. I've never wanted to make a million bucks in my life, but I've always felt like a million bucks when I was able to serve and help someone through public service. That's what I'm all about. I love the people of Georgia, and I love serving them. And I would love to have, have the opportunity to take Senator Sam Nunn's slot in the United States Senate as an independent, moderate, bipartisan member of that great body. I would especially love to take his slot on the Senate Armed Services Committee and continue to speak up for a strong defense and strong support for our military retirees and our veterans. Most of all, though, I would like it said of me when I finish my term in the Senate that he generated hope and opportunity for all of Georgia's citizens. I would love to take Georgia to the max and make sure that every one of our citizens 
lived up to their God-given potential. That's what government's all about. That's what I'm all about. And I ask you to join me Tuesday in taking Georgia to the max. Thank you. Thank you, Max Cleland. And now the closing statement from Republican candidate Guy Milner. Thank you very much, uh, Channel 2 and uh, John Pruitt and the panel for the opportunity to share our thoughts today. And let me say that I'm very sorry that my opponent uh, somehow or another dis discouraged and uh, reduced the opportunities for us to deal with the issues campaigning across the state. And I can understand, I can very much understand why you might be very troubled. Uh, the tone of the television ads certainly has not been a positive one. But I guess I have to share with you that I felt a need I felt the need for you to know the truth, and I wanted every one of our ads to be very, very well documented. I'm not a career politician. You know that by now. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a business person. Who would have thought at age 10 this young boy pumping gas at his dad's service station would have a chance to run for the U.S. Senate? I, I believe we need some common sense, business sense in Washington. You know that our education system is not challenging our young people, and you know that there's a lot of waste in the federal government. I hope that you will consider this Tuesday supporting me and allowing me to take my experience to Washington. Thank you very, very much for listening today. Thank you, Mr. Milner. And now the final closing statement from Libertarian candidate Jack Cash. This race is about the extreme left that wants to get deeper into your pockets, and the extreme right that wants to invade your private life, and the libertarian center, me. Unlike the extremes of the candidates with me tonight, I have been married to my only wife and partner of 48 years, and we have six grown children. I understand the joys and problems of ordinary, ongoing family life. I'm a veteran of World War II, and I'm now an active farmer. I founded a chain of restaurants named Cashins that employed hundreds of people. Both my opponents delude you with exaggerations and campaign promises they, that they can't deliver. Georgians want and deserve a voice of common sense and truth, not phony baloney. If I'm elected, I'll work to reduce government, simplify it, and economize it. I believe, as do my fellow libertarians, in the traditions and values of independence, self-reliance, charity, personal responsibility, and family. I believe in the tolerance of accepting our neighbors for who they are. Most of all, I believe you, you should be trusted to govern your own lives, to spend your money as you decide, not how the government tells you. For it is the individual, you and me, not government, that has made our country what it is. I appeal to you independents, you disgruntled voters, you underrepresented women, you Sam Nunn Democrats, you Johnny Isaacson Republicans, to join me in restoring reason and common sense to our lives. Don't waste your vote for the lesser of two evils. Vote for me because there is a real choice. Gentlemen, thanks to each and every one of you for being here. It's a public service, this last debate before the election on Tuesday. Tomorrow, C-SPAN's live election night coverage begins at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. We'll follow the presidential race, and you'll also see local TV newscasts from across the country for updates of key congressional, Senate, and governor's races. And our cameras will be at Clinton, Dole, and Peru.